What's going on, AP government peeps? We have Chapter 2 of Government in America on the docket for you today. This one is focusing on the Constitution. One of the more important chapters from this textbook are definitely things that you will see focused on your AP exam in May. So let's get started. All right, we're going to talk about politics in action amending the constitution so let's talk about what exactly is a constitution well according to page 30 it is a nation's basic law it creates political institutions allocates power within government and often provides guarantees to citizens and the u.s constitution is the supreme law of the land so whatever it says goes and this guarantees individual rights both in the original constitution as written as well as amendments to the Constitution, including the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments. And individual rights that are guaranteed are, can be unpopular opinions. And we'll see this in Texas versus Johnson, which is a Supreme Court case which dealt with Johnson burning the American flag. And the Supreme Court ruled that that is constitutional. And many people, many Americans disagree with that and think it should be unconstitutional. However, the Supreme Court has interpreted the Constitution to say that it is not. And also the Constitution has limits on the power of government, which we'll talk about in this chapter and the next chapter as well. All right, the origins of the Constitution. Definitely have to know this stuff for your exam. The British colonial relationship changed drastically after the French and Indian War that ended in 1763. Britain was in a lot of debt and they began implementing taxes, most notably the stamp tax, which caused a lot of uproar. It was a tax on 50 commonly used goods. Common Sense was a book or a pamphlet, I should say, written by this guy, T. Payne, Thomas Payne. And he was instrumental in influencing the Declaration of Independence. Common Sense came out in January of 1776, and the Declaration of Independence was written in July of 1776. And the Constitution was written by many individuals, but most notably it was Thomas Jefferson who gets the credit. He played a large role in editing it. And basically what the Declaration is, is a list of grievances against the King, King George III, or KG3. John Locke was very influential in the Constitution. He wrote a very famous book called The Second Treaties of Civil Government, and this is where he develops his theories of natural rights. These are inherent rights or rights that every person is born with, and you're not dependent on the government for these rights. And those rights are life, liberty, and property. And we know Thomas Jefferson and the writers of the Declaration of Independence changed this to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. John Locke also has this idea called the consent of the governed. And this idea states that people decide on government officials. So the government is run with the consent or the support of the people of that area or country. And if the citizens don't like the government, they have the ability to vote them out of office. And if need be in rare circumstances, they can even revolt. Limited government is something that John Locke advocated, and this was restrictions on what the government can do. He, he was not in favor or support of a tyrannical or a monarchy government. And government, the one way to limit government power is that governments must post laws so they can't arbitrarily change them anytime they want. And they cannot take property without consent. And this is something that is really the backbone of the Constitution and the United States, that the government cannot take property without due process or consent. And revolting, as I mentioned, should be saved until injustices are severe. All right, the Articles of Confederation definitely need to know this, and I do have a video on the articles. This is from AP U.S. History. You can check it out in the link below. I have lots of videos on different things we'll be talking about that I go more into depth on. One of the things to keep in mind with the Articles of Confederation was it had a very weak central government, and it consisted of a national legislature with one house. There was not a bicameral or two-house legislature like we have today. It was one house, and each state received one vote. So whether it was a large state population-wise or small, each one had the same voting power. There was no executive branch and no national court. And states had a lot of power. There was this fear, and again, they're coming right off of declaring independence from Great Britain. There was this fear of a strong central government. That's why states had a lot of power. That's why there was no executive branch. And in order to amend the articles, all 13 states would have to consent to it. They would have to agree. So even if one state didn't want to change the articles, then the articles would not be amended. Other problems, there's no national military, and this was exhibited in Shays' Rebellion, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. And the federal government could not collect taxes. They could basically ask the states, hey, we'd like you to contribute this much in taxes, but the states did not have to. So again, very weak central government. 
One of the positives of the Articles of Confederation is the Northwest Land Ordinance of 1787, which deals with that area in black, the Northwest Territory. What this does is it creates a process for adding new land to the Union, specifically states. So once a territory reached 60,000 people, it could apply to be a state. And it also barred slavery in this Northwest Territory. Many states added their own Bill of Rights for additional guarantees against government power. And many of these were freedoms that were similar to the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. Most state, many of the state legislatures were also very powerful and they were more accountable to voters. So voters were more in touch with them and they had the ability to elect them and have more power over them. Shays Rebellion, just to give you a little background, this happens in the late 1780s, was a rebellion in Massachusetts, where, which was led by a former Revolutionary War veteran, Daniel Shays, and he, was, he and his followers were protesting foreclosures on farms. So banks were foreclosing or taking away farms, and he and his followers were very upset about this. This rebellion led to an attack on various courthouses in Massachusetts, so the courts could not rule in favor of the banks on foreclosing. And this, again, demonstrated a major weakness of the Articles because there was no national military. So in a sense, it can be said that Shay's Rebellion was instrumental in the Constitutional Convention. This helped a lot of people realize that, you know what, this national government really isn't working. We can't protect people from rebellions. Then we have the Annapolis Convention, which happens one year before the Constitutional Convention, and the purpose was to discuss the Articles, and only five states showed up. And I have this picture here of Alexander Hamilton, because he shows up there, and he really gives very powerful speeches and gets consent from the states that are there that they will hold a convention the following year in Philadelphia. And that leads to what we know as the Constitutional Convention. All right, all states, so all 12 states except Rhode Island, showed up to this Constitutional Convention. There are four philosophies of government that will be focused on, that they focus on. One, human nature, and this is the belief that people were self-interested and they would work in, in, on behalf of their own self-interest. They also realized that there was political conflict. Madison, who is dubbed the father of the Constitution, believed that the distribution of wealth was the cause of conflict. And we're not just talking, you know, money in terms of cash or gold and silver. We're talking about property as well. So he said that most conflict came about because of the distribution of wealth. And this would lead to a rise of factions or different groups. And this was a concern of many people. So later on, when, when he and two others write the Federalist Papers, he talks about there, there were ways to check the power of factions. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit in this video. And I have another video on Federalist Papers 10 and 51, two very big ones that do appear on AP government exams quite often. They also talked about the objects of government, and this is the belief that the government should preserve the right to achieve wealth. So individuals should be able to have freedom to make as much money and own as much land as they want. And they also talked about the nature of government, and they believed in a balanced government or separation of powers. So, so critical issues at the convention. If somebody asks you what is the number one issue at the Constitutional Convention, you could probably sum it up with one word in representation. So we have two different plans that emerge. We have the New Jersey plan, which is a small state, and this was introduced by William Patterson. When I'm talking about small state, I'm not talking about size physically. I'm talking about the amount of people in that state. So the New Jersey plan proposed a unicameral legislature with equal representation per state. This is basically the Articles of Confederation. Well, Edmund Randolph in Virginia, which was the most populated state at the time, did not like that idea. So he proposes a bicameral, which means two-house legislature, with representation to be based on population. He actually proposed that representation in each house should be based on population. So then we have what's known as the Connecticut Compromise, or the Great Compromise, which is credited to this guy, Roger Sherman. So what this does is it creates a bicameral legislature, again, a two-house legislature. One, the House of Representatives is based on population, and the other, the Senate, is based on equal representation. So he kind of takes pieces of both the New Jersey and Virginia plan and forms them in the Great Compromise, which is how our legislative branches run today.
And citizens in smaller states have more power over senators than larger states. So think about California, which is the most populous state. There's about 65 million people, I think. Um, there are two senators for 65 million people. Then you go to another state, say Alaska, and I don't know how many people are in Alaska, but I know it's way less than 65 million. Those voters are have more influence over their senators and really more power over them. Slavery was another huge issue at the Constitutional Convention. And as of 1787, only Massachusetts outlawed slavery. And the Constitution banned the importation of slaves after 1808. That was another compromise, the slave trade compromise. But the major slave compromise that dealt with the issue of slaves then was the three-fifths compromise. And this stated that three out of five slaves would be counted towards representation in the House of Representatives. So in determining population that would then determine representation in the House of Representatives, Three out of five slaves will count. So if Virginia had 100 slaves, 60 slaves will count towards the population of Virginia to help determine representation for the House of Representatives. And voting requirements were left to the states. And this is why we're going to see later on in the Reconstruction time period, literacy tests and poll taxes develop. And ultimately, the federal government is going to have to step in to make those illegal, but not until the 1960s. All right, some economic issues. Under the articles, each state could do the following. They could create tariffs on goods from other states. They could also issue their own currency, which had fluctuating values. And this helped discourage trade. And that was a very big problem. Congress was in charge of virtually all economic policies under the Constitution. So they have the ability to tax, to borrow, and to appropriate money. They can also today punish counter and back then punish counterfeiters and also issue patents and copyrights. These are all on a federal level thing. You should definitely be able to identify things that Congress can and cannot do. But perhaps the biggest thing that they can do is regulate interstate trade and that is trade between one or more states. And personal freedoms under the ratified constitution, you see that word ratified because the Bill of Rights were not a part of the ratified constitution. It prohibited the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus in most cases and what that means is that you can be held without having charges brought against you. That is not something that's allowed to happen. You can also, the federal government can also not pass bills of attainder. In other words, not giving you a judicial trial. And it prohibits the passage of ex post facto laws. What that means is that if you did something when it was legal and it later becomes illegal, you can't get in trouble for it for doing it when it was legal. So New York State, we are not allowed to talk on our cell phones while we are driving. It is illegal. But say 10 years ago when it was legal, if I did that, New York State can't come back and find me or give me tickets for talking on my phone while driving while it was legal. That's an example of an ex post facto law. And there's also very strict rules for conviction of treason. Citizens are entitled to a trial by jury in almost all cases as well. So these are different freedoms that individuals have and also is a way to limit the power of the government. So let's talk about the Madisonian system. Many framers feared the power of the non-wealthy majority. Most Americans then and now are not a part of the wealthy majority. So there were safeguards that were set up to protect the government from the non-wealthy majority. Most government was beyond the control of the majority, and we see this in the separation of powers. We also see checks and balances in which one branch can check the power of another one. Other ways that the government was able to limit majority control, let's look at Congress. Well, the ha House of Representatives was one half of the three branches because the other half would be the Senate. That was the only part of Congress that was directly elected by citizens under the original Constitution. The senators were not elected until much later. So out of the three branches, only one half of them were directly elected by the people. Supreme Court justices are not elected by the people. They are appointed by the president. And even the president is not elected by the people. The president is elected by the Electoral College. The election of the House of Representatives occurs every two years, whereas the senators who were originally appointed by state legislators occurred every six years, with one third up for reelection every two years. So the Senate is never entirely up for reelection. And judges serve for life as a way to keep politics out of their decisions. Separating powers, again, we have three branches, each having distinct powers, and 
they also created checks and balances, and this was using the power against power to limit government action. So there's specific things that each branch could do to the other one to limit government action. You should be able to identify different checks that each branch has on another branch. Federalism, which is which the next chapter is all about, is establishing to divide power between the federal and state governments. And this is another way to limit the power of the government. The Constitution created a public, not a direct, democracy. So let's define these two terms. Well, a republic is using the consent of the governed to elect representatives to make decisions. And this is what we live in the United States, a republic, where we vote for members of the House of Representatives and senators to vote on our behalf. It is not a direct democracy in which citizens vote on issues. If we lived in a direct democracy, we would have the ability to vote on almost every single law. I don't know about you, but that would take a lot of time. I don't know how many people would actually do that. And checks and balances, another thing to keep in mind, really makes change more difficult. Think about how many obstacles a law has to pass through. It's tough enough to get out of Congress, and then once it does, the president can veto it if the president feels that that law is bad. Then Congress, if they want, can override that veto, but then ultimately the Supreme Court can strike it down as unconstitutional. So when we think about how many laws we have, it's really amazing to think how much more there could be if it weren't for this checks and balances. All right, ratifying the Constitution. There are two groups that you should know, and these are not political parties yet. The Federalists are those that supported the Constitution, and the Anti-Federalists are those that oppose the Constitution. So in order to gain support for the ratification of the Constitution, the Federalist Papers are written. And they're written by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. And the purpose of this was to try to persuade the ratification of the Constitution specifically the New York legislature. Most historians agree that the Federalist Papers did not actually influence the New York legislature, but these papers do a really good job of showing what the creators of the Constitution were thinking and their ideas about government. So there are 85 total essays, and number 10 and number 51 are the most popular, and both of those were written by James Madison. And in 10, he talks about factions or groups, and he says that, you know what, groups, and don't think of them as political parties, because he wasn't talking about political parties here. He was just talking about groups of people who have similar ideas. He said these are in inevitable. They're not, they're not good, but they're inevitable, so we have to deal with them. And then in 51, he talks about separation of powers, this idea of three different branches of government and federalism as well. This is his way of explaining how the Constitution is set up. So why did anti-federalists oppose the Constitution? Again, there's this fear of a strong central government. England was, you know, it was only about 13 years before that Great Britain was in control of America. And there's a lack of protection of liberties from the federal government. So what is the solution to this? Ultimately, the Bill of Rights is added, and that allows the Anti-Federalists to approve or ratify the Constitution. And George Washington became president on April 30th, 1789. So there's two ways to amend the Constitution, and it's happened 27 times. Two-thirds of Congress can propose an amendment, and then once they past that, it has to go out to the states. And three-quarters of the state legislatures or three-quarters of the state conventions must ratify. So this is a two-part process. One on the federal government under Congress and two on the state levels under state legislatures or state conventions. The other way is if two-thirds of states call for a national convention and they can propose an amendment, then three-quarters of the state legislatures or three-quarters of the state conventions must also ratify it. And it's important to know that the President and Supreme Court has absolutely no role in the amendment process, none whatsoever. It is strictly a legislature and state issue. And most amendments have expanded liberty and equality. And specifically the first 10 amendments and the Reconstruction Amendments 13, 14, and 15. And I will have videos coming out on these very soon. The Equal Rights Amendment is a very popular amendment we'll talk a lot about throughout this course. This was proposed but never ratified. It was proposed in 1972 and never ratified. It fell three states shy of ratification. All states in red are those that ratified it. And if three more of those non-red states would have ratified it, this would have been an amendment. Now, amendments are the formal way to change the Constitution. There is an informal way of changing it as well. And, and the most powerful and frequent one is judicial interpretation. And judicial review was established through Marbury versus Madison. Absolutely, positively, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. 
know this. And judicial review is the ability of the Supreme Court to declare a law unconstitutional. An example of using judicial review, let's look at Plessy versus Ferguson. The Supreme Court stated that separate but equal did not violate the 14th Amendment. I do have a video on Plessy versus Ferguson. So, so the Supreme Court then said it doesn't violate separate but equal. However, in 1954, which I also have a video on, Supreme Court reversed that with Brown versus Board. That's an example of judicial review. We also see changing political practice. After 1800, political parties required electors for the Electoral College to vote for the state's popular vote winner. So this really kind of changes the playing field of how the Electoral College works. And technology, media can reach Americans on many issues today much more frequently than they could 20 years ago. Go, let alone 200 years ago, and presidential powers have increased, especially when it comes to weapons and the military. And this has increased drastically, especially since FDR and the New Deal, continuing through the 1960s with the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution and forward. We also have an increase in demand on policymakers. So presidential powers during war increases. Anytime there's a war, the president's power goes up. The Patriot Act, which was passed after 9-11, provides for powers for wiretapping and surveillance of suspected terrorists. And these are things that the government can do without a warrant necessarily. Yet, the Patriot Act has not been declared unconstitutional. And the Constitution is flexible. All right, since its inception, the Constitution has become much more democratic. Five of the last 17 amendments expanded the electorate or the ability for people to vote. The 15th Amendment extended suffrage to African American males, so many more individuals are then able to vote. 19 gave women the right to vote. The 23rd Amendment gave the ability for people living in Washington, D.C. to vote for president, and the 24th Amendment eliminated poll taxes, which I talked about a little bit earlier. And the 26th Amendment, the second last amendment that was ratified, lowered the voting age to 18. So those five amendments provided more people to vote in this country than under the original Constitution. All right, let's do a quick recap. Definitely know the influences of the Enlightenment. And no, John Locke and Thomas Paine and their influences on the American government. The articles provided a weak central government and were very ineffective. Shays' rebellion influenced the Constitution, especially in terms of needing a national military. No, the compromises at the Constitution and that they were based on representation, especially the Connecticut also known as the Great Compromise and the Three-Fifths Compromise. Federalist Papers 10 and 51 absolutely positively know both of them. They talk about factions are unavoidable and they can be checked in this idea of separation of powers. Be able to identify specific checks and balances that each branch has. And Marbury versus Madison established judicial review. All right, that's everything you need to know about Chapter 2. If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to my channel. Help me spread the word. If you found this video helpful, please share it with somebody else. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section below or tweet me on Twitter at Adam Norris AP. I thank you guys very much for watching and have a good day.